Okay, two things. Like first, it's like um, so I'm, I reach that age that I need bifocals. So like I have to like I can't see you. Like I can see down, but I can't see you up. So then, but I forgot them at home, <laughs> and so like I can't really see you. So I can't put this on because I can't read. So I can, I, I feel kind of bad because I can't oh, see. <laughs> yeah. no. Oh no, it's okay. Um, and then you know I've, I've given a lot of talks, but then it's like suddenly I was like started this one. I'm kind of nervous, and I'm like, why am I nervous? I'm never nervous. But I think because there's so many smart people in this room. In all honesty. <laughs> Um, and, and then there's a lot of lawyers, and then I'm like, oh my god, I'm gonna give this talk, and then they're gonna be like, what's your source? <laughs> yeah, it's like, where where are you making that claim from? Um, but a lot of people in this in this room have uh, has influenced me a lot, and um, and um, so the talk I'm gonna give is from this book that I am trying to write on um, migrant, I dropped Singapore because it was like too hard to compare them, um, just migrant domestic workers in the United Arab Emirates. And um, I gave um, uh, Ermila um, from um, Humboldt University in um, Berlin, she's here somewhere, um, she um, invited me to a conference where um, Helma Lutz was also a keynote speaker. And um, so I'm not going to give the same talk, so I don't want to bore you. <laughs> so the talk I gave at that conference was actually the, the um, theoretical argument of the book. Um, I was trying to theorize, like, what is freedom? Trying to figure out that question. And then this talk, um, so one of the, the main arguments I'm making in this book is sort of like how morals play a role and shape this relationship of inequality between employers and domestic workers in this context of severe inequality and how morals you know, complicate um, the, um, sort of the dynamics and um, also questions then um, the reduction of, such a, of this relationship of severe inequality to one of just oppression. And so that's what I'm trying to, gonna try. It. So it's like, what are they? So I'm looking at intimacy, I guess, through this sort of lens of morals. Um, so, okay, so let me um, start. Um, so I think everyone in this room knows that across the globe, migrant domestic workers are what we can categorize as unfree workers. And this is because, it, including in, in Israel as well, in most destinations, um, the terms of their legal residency is contingent not only on their continuous and sole live-in employment in one household, but also that it's made very hard for them by the state to change their job. So this is the case, like I said, in Israel, but also Canada, Taiwan, Singapore, and among other, many other Arab states, the United Arab Emirates. And so aggravating the unfreedom of domestic workers is this absence of flexibility for them to change employment. And so in Taiwan, for example, um, they can only change their job if the state deems their employer no longer fit to employ them. And that would happen if the employer died or declared bankruptcy. Um, in the United Arab Emirates, um, domestic workers, and this is also the case in various Arab states, but also in Singapore, domestic workers cannot change jobs without first securing the permission of their employer. Um, and so finally, um, in the UAE, um, domestic workers who quote unquote abscond, and that is run away and flee um, an employer, even an, abu an abusive employer, um, they risk incarceration when they do so. And so the unfreedom of domestic workers is arguably then a form of quote unquote forced intimacy, one experienced by uh, the largest group of labor migrants globally. And so to address the conference theme of quote, globe-bordered glo intimacy, I wish to focus on the unfreedom of domestic workers and the cultures of employer and employee relations that arise from this bound relationship of unequal dependency. Um, so the unfreedom of domestic workers engenders a particular type of intimate relationship. And surely at first it's an unequal one. Domestic workers cannot sever this relationship easily, but employers, um, notwithstanding the financial considerations that they have, can. We can also say that it's a form of um, forced intimacy it is, as it is a bound relationship that technically ties each party to one another. So the unfree status of migrant domestic workers is premised on this unequal but yet intimate relationship between domestic workers and employers. And freedom thus invites us to engage various questions on global bordered intimacy, um, 
prodded by the conference organizers, including, and so these are questions from our organizers, how are intimate relations practiced, maintained, and evaluated in the immigration social context. Um, in this case, uh, this social context would be this unfreedom. And lastly, um, and so we can also ask, how is the unre unregulated sphere of a household a globe-bordered um, workplace? And lastly, how do cultural contestation, uh, cultural conventions and normative expectations in relation to intimate relationships influence the migrant experience of being bound to an employer? And so on freedom as a globe-bordered intimacy um, should be of significance to this conference on migration because it pertains to one of the largest constituencies of migrant workers globally, and that is domestic workers. So across the globe, there are an estimated 11.5 million migrant domestic workers. Um, the highest concentration of these workers are employed in the Middle East, um, as 27.4% of them are, can be found in Arab states. Um, and in Arab states, they comprise about 18% of all migrant workers in the region. Um, and what's interesting, um, they're also 60.8% of all women labor migrants in the region. Um, so this is um, followed by migrant domestic workers in Southeast Asia um, at 19.4%, uh, where they comprise nearly 40% of all women migrant workers. And so migrant domestic workers come from a wide range of source countries, Kenya and Ethiopia, Nicaragua, Peru, Mexico, Estonia, Ukraine, Poland, Nepal, Sri Lanka, India, and finally um, Indonesia, Myanmar, and the Philippines. And of these groups um, across the world, Southeast Asians actually constitute the largest number, with Indonesians estimated to number uh, 2.1 million and Filipinos at 1.4 million. Um, so the status of domestic workers as unfree workers um, elicits a type of global-bordered intimacy. And so um, I, I couldn't find a definition in the website of the conference. So I said, I define global, global bordered intimacy as state-determined intimate matters and globalization. And so states may hinder intimacy, as we see with the ineligibility of migrant workers to reunify their families. Yet states may also force intimacy, and this is the case among domestic workers whose legal residency ties them to an employer. And freedom for domestic workers is a state-determined status, one engendered by the terms of their membership in receiving societies and embedded in the intimate and bound relationship of inequality between domestic workers and their employers. And so in this talk, I want to unpack um, the contours of global bordered intimacy in the workplace of unfree domestic workers. And so to link unfreedom and global bordered intimacy and to unpack the contours of global bordered intimacy, um, so I want to ask these questions. So what are the labor conditions elicited by unfreedom? And how does intimacy, particularly um, in the forced intimacy of bound uh, labor, um, shape these conditions? And finally, how do um, domestic workers utilize intimacy um, to negotiate their work conditions? And so my talk to address these questions focuses solely, sorry, this is sort of small, solely on the case of the United Arab Emirates, um, which is a key destination of the estimated 11.5 million migrant domestic workers globally. So according to the ILO, there's about 750,000 migrant, uh, migrant domestic workers in the UAE with 65% employed in the Emirates of Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and Sharjah. And they comprise 20% of all foreign workers in the country. And domestic workers in the UAE come um, from primarily from um, Southeast Asia, but they're also from Africa, Ethiopia, and Kenya, and then um, Bangla um, sh like South Asian countries like Bangladesh, India, and Nepal. Um, and labor and migration conditions arguably make the UAE, which is why, uh, which is the, one of the reasons why I selected it as a site. Um, it makes the conditions there make it one of the "quote unquote" worst destinations for migrant workers globally. Um, and so, along with other destinations in the Middle East, it's first considered um, less desirable because of its low wages. Um, and so. While, um, so, while countries sort of mandate a particular minimum wage, so the Philippines has mandated for a $400 monthly wage for their workers, Indonesia, 333 US dollars, and Bangladesh, 160 US dollars a month. Um, so if just looking at the case of the Philippines, most of their starting salary is actually like 225 to 275 uh, US dollars a month. Um, and so um, this minimum wage, wage um, is low, but it's higher than how much Bangladesh requires for its workers. Um, and so further making the UAE an undesirable destination is the absence of labor protection. 
Um, so domestic workers are included, excluded from the 1980 labor law, as well as the recent reforms to the kafala, and that's the sponsorship system which binds a foreign worker to an employer. Um, labor conditions are also poor in the UAE. Most uh, domestic workers have to do quote-unquote all-around work, and that's cook, clean, and care. Um, and um, while there is now a mandatory uh, weekly rest day that was instituted in 2017, uh, the UAE government, like the Singaporean government, actually allows employers to bypass this by paying um, the women, uh, they're mostly women, uh, extra for their labor for the day. Um, and also, it, it's just been very difficult to enforce this mandatory uh, weekly rest day. And so because of this, uh, domestic workers are at a high risk of isolation, which is a condition aggravated by the likelihood of their limited access to the internet or mobile phone. So the unfreedom of domestic workers in the UAE, as I noted earlier, is not exceptional, but it is a condition shared by those in other destinations. So other scholars have accordingly called attention to the unfree status of domestic workers. And the first to do so had been geographers um, Sherlina Wang and Brenda Yeo. Um, looking at Singapore, they perceived the bound status of domestic workers as a reflection of the state's abdication of its responsibility for setting a standard of employment and an indication of the ultimate designation of domestic work as a private household responsibility. Uh, for the most part, uh, scholars see the bound status of domestic workers as nothing but a tool of oppression that employers can then use to maximize the labor of domestic workers. And the first to advance that argument was Bridget Anderson in 2000 when she was writing on Britain. And she argues that the bound labor of domestic workers promotes this quote unquote master slave um, dynamic in the relationship. Um, Kevin Bales, um, looking at the situation of domestic workers in the United States, argues that it results in nothing but what he calls quote unquote contract slavery. And then both Pardis Madavi and Amrita Pandey um, basically say that if you look at the kafala system in the UAE and Lebanon respectively, um, because it's sort of a form of indenture um, that subjugates domestic workers, we have to see this as nothing but structural violence. And so the reduction of bound labor to either slavery or structural violence, basically it follows a Marxist framework and it fits the logic behind Michael Borovoy's classic discussion of the politics of production and manufacturing employment. And so Borovoy argues that without state intervention, employers would maximize the labor of their workers, resulting in what he calls market despotism. And so all of this is sort of a type of market despotism going on in the households of these employers. And so um, in agreement with Borovoy, the literature basically assumes that all these employers would act as tyrannical despots and accordingly enact the terror of slavery or structural violence on their domestic workers. But this assumption does not really reflect the reality of domestic workers on the ground, and not all employers, employers abuse domestic workers, even in the worst destination of the UAE. And so what I'm trying to do in this book is try to figure out, well, how can I account for the fact that not all employers um, are despots, and how can we, add, how can we um, you, you know, not ignore that, but make that sort of in the center of our analysis of unfree labor. So um, in the UAE, as is the case in other destinations, um, there's no standard of employment for domestic workers. So in the UAE, for instance, some have a day off and others do not. Some are given this month a monthly vacation every year. Some are given one every two years. Some are allowed to do part-time jobs in other households um, as a means of e earning extra income, but most are not. Uh, most are paid by their employers at the end of each month, but some employers choose to withhold the wages of domestic workers and not pay them until the end of their two-year contract. Um, some are allowed to have a boyfriend, but most are not. Um, some are overworked, averaging 18 hours a day, while there are some who work for less than eight hours a day. Um, a few people who I've met in the UAE have faced extreme brutality at work, with some raped tortured and starved, um, but the vast majority are not brutalized. So even those who run away, risking imprisonment in the process, are unlikely to have been brutalized as the majority flee because of quote-unquote overwork or isolation in their job. And so the reduction of these various experiences to quote-unquote structural violence or slavery um, flattens this diversity. And so to explain this diversity, we need to shift from a deductive reading of unfree labor as structural violence to an inductive analysis of unfree labor as a lived experience. And doing so requires, we uh, explain the lack of uniformity in the unregulated workspaces of the quote unquote worst destination of the UAE. 
And so, um, so to describe the labor conditions of domestic workers in that country, um, I'm going to rely primarily on the interviews that I conducted with domestic workers, um, Filipino domestic workers in that country. Um, I want to say that I did not utilize convenient sampling, like many people assume, because um, doing so would have um, resulted in a, a pretty biased sample that I would have just like... Um, sort of just presented the worst experiences possible there. Because if you do convenient sampling in this context, the most convenient place to access them would be the migrant shelters uh, where everyone knows they're at. And so like the problem with many of my colleagues who've done this work before me is that they've overly, overly relied on these migrant shelters. And so you just get the worst possible outcomes of um, the job conditions there. So I made sure not to overly rely on those shelters when I was doing this research. And I sought um, a diverse sample by identifying research participants in a wide range of settings that included parks, um, food courts, supermarkets, places of worship, and neighborhoods. Um, and my, um, so I also made sure that I had um, undocumented and documented workers, and I made sure I had workers who were, didn't have a day off and had a day off. And I found people without a day off at supermarkets or parks, you know, they're walking dogs at six in the morning, for example, or they're shopping for their households at any time of a given day. Um, and um, I also made sure that they represented a diverse household, um, that they worked for diverse households that included Emirati, uh, Indians, Persians, um, Westerners. And so in addition to um, interviews with domestic workers, um, this talk also draws from interviews that I did with government officials and employers, content analysis of articles on maids published um, in two years in the two largest uh, circulating English language newspapers. And then I also did participant observation of um, government-run seminars for outgoing migrant domestic workers bound to um, the Middle East. Um, and I did those, uh, per, uh, that uh, ethnography in Manila. And so, um, so the Philippine government estimates that there are, I'm giving you like background um, still before I go into my data, there's about 68,000 Filipino domestic workers in Dubai, just in Dubai. And based on my interviews, um, they most likely lived in poverty prior to migration. So this picture is of a typical house where they lived before they left. Uh, they likely came from rural areas of the Philippines and they did not reside in a cement house. No one resided in a cement house prior to migration among my interviewees, um, but like a, what's called a nipa hut. Um, that's a stilt house with a thatched roof. And they had a low level of educational attainment with many only finishing um, up to the sixth grade. Um, and they had very limited job prospects. Many were single mothers with a sizable number of those from the Muslim autonomous region of Mindanao, having had an arranged marriage um, at 13 years old and their first child by the time they were 14 years old. So it was actually pretty odd for me that women my age were like grandmothers. Women in their 30s had teenage children in college. So that was like, you know, kind of just really hard for me to, to get used to, you know, in conversations with them. Um, so there are many categories we can use to measure the labor conditions of migrant domestic workers. So in strict, there are extrinsic conditions such as wages, access to freedom, and the workload or intrinsic conditions such as the tacit skills they gain from the job. And so to contain my um, comparison of labor conditions across households, I'm only going to talk about the food consumption of domestic workers. And this is because it was a condition that they most frequently used when asked to evaluate their employer. A comment they frequently shared, for example, is, quote, my employer is the best. She lets me eat what I want to eat, unquote. And so this is an example of just like, and so, I, so I'm friends with, I'm tracking 30 of them in Facebook. I didn't say that in my method section, but I'm tracking 30 of them in Facebook. And, and once in a while, they'll send me a private message. And this is one woman who is in Kuwait, and she asked me, how are you? And I said, I'm okay, how are you? And then she goes, I'm okay here in Kuwait. Thank God that my employer is so very kind and all the food are given to me. You know, so again, food. It's always like they always tell me about how great their employer is because they feed them. So I want to acknowledge that other scholars have also used food to describe the labor conditions of domestic workers. So the, um, Nicole Constable, when she wrote on domestic workers in Hong Kong, Shelley Cohen, Cohen, who studied Caribbean domestic workers in New York, and lastly, Pirette Honda Nusatello, who interviewed employers and Latina domestic workers in Los Angeles. But um, in contrast to them, however, um, I don't only use food to illustrate inequalities in domestic work. In contrast, I found that food is not just a mechanism of oppression, but instead it's a neutral window for us to use to look at various standards of employment in domestic work. 
So an inductive analysis of the labor conditions of domestic workers in the UAE shows that their experiences fall under three categories. So they're either dehumanized, infantilized, and or recognized. So when it comes to food consumption, to be dehumanized means being inadequately fed. To be infantilized means to be without the ability to determine what and when one should consume food. And finally, to be recognized, me, recognized means to be treated with dignity and respect and given free reign and access to food. So these categories are not new, but they resonate with the literature on domestic work. So in particular, the analysis of intimacy and employer-employee relations in previous studies is what this resonates with. So the first category of dehumanization agrees with the narrative of slavery. It's something that's not supposed to happen anymore. Um, the second category reflects the observations made by Judith Rollins on the maternalism between African-American domestic workers and their mostly white employers in Boston in the late 20th century. And then finally, the third category reflects what Priyat Handanyu Satalo identifies as the contemporary culture of employer-employee relations, which she says is no longer one of maternalism, but instead um, what she calls, quote, in instrumental personalism, unquote. So like employers are nice to you so that they can get more out of you, but then they're really nice to you. Um, and so in contrast, what I found in the UAE, there's no prevailing culture of employer-employee relations. And you also don't have this teleology of history, right? So all of these three are actually coexisting. Um, and like sort of how the literature sort of suggests that they kind of has, have changed through time. Um, so let me now address each one of them. Um, so dehumanized domestic workers are those who are subject to limited food intake. Some employers forcibly limit the food consumed by domestic workers when they reduce their meals to one a day limit their food portions and or distinguish the food that the employer eats from what the domestic worker eats. So in its mildest form, limited food intake occurs when employers deny domestic workers access to particular foods. So a common occurrence is denying domestic workers access to expensive foods like um, exotic fruits like blueberry is very exotic in the UAE or imported cheeses like manchego cheese. Then there are employers who limit the food portion of domestic workers, for instance, subjecting them to leftovers. So in its worst form, limited food intake is nothing but forced starvation. So this is the case for domestic workers who are limited to one meal a day. So when, uh, what accounts for the limited food intake of domestic workers? So without question, employers perceive domestic workers as subordinates when they do this. Denying domestic workers access to a blueberry, which had been the case for a domestic workers, worker of this Swedish venture capitalist, reminds them of their lesser social status. In some cases, employers perceive their domestic workers as subhuman. So one runaway shared that when she complained to her female domestic work, uh, to her female employer about needing to eat more than once a day, her quote unquote madam told her, quote, you can survive on just water. Dogs only need to eat once a day. So why can't you, unquote. Then when she complained to her male employer, telling him that if she does not get fed more, she will likely die, he replied, quote, if you die, I will throw you in a garbage can. You are from the Philippines, you are not Emirati, unquote. So um, who are these racist employers uh, when they, while well, they tend to be Emirati, and so I can talk, there's a sort of weird relationship they have with the law. In another chapter I talk about it, they have this sort of relationship of legal absolution uh, because sort of the state sort of lets them get away with many things. Um, but so it's not like all Emiratis are doing this because they have this weird status vis-a-vis -vis the law. Instead, it's likely to be older Emirati, those who lived in the country before 1963 when slavery was still in, very much in place in the UAE. And they also tend to be non-cosmopolitan. So what we noticed was that all these employers who are starving their domestic workers come from em emirates that people in this room, unless they've lived in the UAE, probably not really heard of, like Fujera, Ras Al Khaimah, uh, those kinds of emirates. Um, and so the remote, isolated places. Um, so um, infantilized domestic workers, the second group, are those who are fed at least three meals a day, but they are not given the option to choose what they can eat. So in this regard, they are infantilized because employers ignore their cultural needs or their individual preferences. So reflecting a common complaint, one of the domestic workers we interviewed, quote, said, Filipinos are rice-eating people. 
We need to eat rice for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, our employers only eat bread in the morning and think we will be fine also just eating bread. But we need to eat more than bread to do our work, unquote. So in examples of employers who have um, forced domestic workers to adopt their eating habits include a physical trainer who's on a perpetual diet. And so she always gives them quinoa and thinks, I'm such a nice employer because my domestic worker can eat all the quinoa they want, but there's no rice in my house because it's high in sugar, right? And then an Indian family who only eats uh, spicy vegetarian food and a Lebanese family whose domestic worker said, quote, I have to eat mostly Lebanese food, but it is fine. I have to thank God that all of their food is okay by me, unquote. And so unfortunately, you know, the, the domestic worker of the personal trainer doesn't really share her sentiments. And neither does the domestic worker who has an employer who only eats spicy vegetarian food. And so why do employers disregard the eating preferences of their domestic workers? Um, some, like, they just don't even think twice about it, right? They're, like, very self-centered in the way they behave vis-a-vis -vis their, their domestic. But in other cases, because they can't really afford to feed them anything else but whatever they're eating. Um, so in the UAE, income requirements for a foreigner to sponsor a domestic worker is minimal. It's only 1,617 U.S. dollars a month. That's how much you should be making which, you know, you can imagine how much a domestic worker is earning then if their employer is making so little, right? Um, but sometimes, you know, as, but then the, the vegetarian Indian family are actually pretty wealthy. So sometimes they're just really disregarding the needs of the domestic worker. So let's talk about the third group. So not all employers dehumanize or infantilize their domestic workers. Many recognize the humanity, the personhood of the domestic worker, even if only partially. One way they demonstrate this recognition is by providing domestic workers with the option to eat what and when they want to eat. So three prevailing um, eating arrangements for recognized domestic workers are um, the provision of a food allowance, uh, full access to the food of employers. Um, and so like a lot of times the domestic worker would shop for the household and the employer is like, you can just add whatever you want to the groceries and eat whatever you want, right? Um, and so that's a third way. But, but I want to say... Um, Recognition does not necessarily mean that it's like equal, like, you know, that it does not sig signify equality or the elimination of race or class boundaries. It's also one we should not necessarily celebrate as employers who recognize the human rights or personhood of their domestic worker. Um, they're not necessarily altruistic. A lot of times they sort of recognize domestic workers because they know they have to, right? It's like sort of this reluctant recognition of the human rights of the domestic worker. Um, they kind of know it's wrong to not let them, you know what I mean, not all, like if your family's going to go out to have burgers, it's like, it's bad if we don't offer the domestic worker a burger, right? So you kind of just know you're supposed to do that. But even though they do that, it's not like they're happy to do that, I want to say. So I want to give you a quote. This is like a British employer named Caroline. I, I love this quote because it kind of gives you a sense of sort of the, how hard it is for some employers. So not all employers are generous is the point. So Caroline shared with us, quote, now they just expect to have free reign on your, your refrigerator. And you know, and when they're doing the shopping as well, like mine, you find they're buying things that they don't need. Or they'll buy shrimps or something to make um, their shrimp noodles. And I'd never buy shrimps. And then they're buying themselves cans of Coca-Cola and things. And I'm saying, look, you know, I didn't, I didn't say I was going to keep you in bloody tin soft drinks, you know. I'm not going to pay for that. You want Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola, buy it out of your wages. A lot of them are asking for toiletries as well. And I'm saying, piss off. I owe you. I pay you enough money to buy you your own antiperspirant, unquote, right? So they're pushing the envelope the whole time is what this, domestic, this employer thinks. They're asking for more and more is what she says. So Carolyn's rant is actually significant. It signals this hidden transcript among employers um, that indicate their preference to barely spend for their domestic workers. So it warns us of the precari precariousness of recognition, but it also indicates this moral pressure for employers sort of to behave correctly, right? So indeed, most employers recognize the humanity of domestic workers um, to be fed in in adequately is a reality um, confronted by some domestic workers, but it is rare. So now let me get into my analysis. So how do we explain these sort of variations in standards of employment for domestic workers? Um, so I want to argue that morals mediate experiences of unfree labor and helping us see how morals could shape the unregulated labor of domestic work. Um, I turn to the robust literature on moralized markets. 
So we can argue that domestic work encompasses what Marion Fourcade and Kieran Healy call a moralized market, meaning it is, quote, an explicitly moral project that is simultaneously guided by rationalism and justice. Applied to the case of domestic work, moral views on domestic work are shaped not only by profit maximization, like my other colleagues have argued, but also by religious values, cultural norms, and ideological principles. But morals don't come from a vacuum. Instead, in the case of domestic work, they emerge from the labor of what we can call moral entrepreneurs, who try to create norms or standards using varying degrees of either absolutist or relativist notions of human rights. And so by moral entrepreneurs, I draw from the work of How Howard Becker and refer to individuals, groups, and organizations that construct particular rights-based norms or standards, so much so that when you diverge from them, you'd be a deviant. So like Caroline, for example, feels like if I don't allow her to eat her shrimps, I'll be like kind of a deviant, right? So how these rights-based norms or standards manifest in the workplace inform the moral logics of employer actions and shape what Didier Fassan calls the quote-unquote moral subjectivities of employers is what I want to address so it's to explain sort of these variations in labor standards. Um, so there's a robust uh, discussion on the intersections of morals and markets, but I wish to focus solely on the question that underlies this talk, which is how do morals mitigate unfettered markets, right, of domestic work in this case? And so to put it another way, how do morals potentially mitigate employer abuse or the maximization of the extraction of labor in the unregulated workplace of domestic work? And so there's two prevailing views. The first, through a discussion of the moral economy of the working or peasant class, um, they establishes sort of the principles of moral justice emerging from collective protest. And then the second perspective establishes how morals, as they are embedded and re-embedded in the market, and we could argue the workplace, are implemented via legislation. So I want to say neither one fully applies to the case of domestic workers in Dubai, the UAE, and this is because um, in the UAE, any form of public protest or political gathering is prohibited. And then technically domestic workers are legally protected by criminal and anti-trafficking laws, as well as the newly instituted federal law number 10 of 2017, that's the domestic worker law. But then enforcement of these have been difficult, right? And so this is because domestic work occurs in this intimate space outside the realm of the public. So in the absence of protests and the near absence of law, the question then is how do morals shape labor um, standards in intimate and, and, and unregulated workplaces. So this is what I gonna tr I'm going to try to argue. <laughs> Sorry, it's kind of a mess. So, um, so what I'm trying to show, what I want to show, what I want to argue is that there are these um, various stakeholders that promote aspirational labor standards for domestic workers. So um, three of the largest stakeholders are the ILO, which passed the Decent Work for Domestic Worker Convention in 2011. Second is the U.S. Department of State, which monitors the treatment of domestic workers and other groups. And um, they identify, you know, people who are identified, who are vulnerable to trafficking in their annual trafficking in persons report. And every year, domestic workers in the UAE are in that report. And then finally, there are groups like Human Rights Watch, other watchdog organizations, advocacy group, um, migrant rights Dot org is the biggest one in, in the Middle East, and they regularly publish and disseminate critical reports on the subpar labor conditions of domestic workers in the region. So these stakeholders fit what Becker would consider a moral entrepreneur to be. The aspirational labor standards they create are disseminated and potentially reach employers in three ways. First, they reach them through the media, through press releases that spread information on the appropriate and inappropriate treatment of domestic workers. Second, they're promoted via legislation. Um, and then um, they empower sending states. Just, so the Philippines does a lot of these legislations like uh, to protect domestic workers, like the minimum wage of 400 US dollars is an example. Um, and so labor standards are also promoted through these various government programs. So in the case of the UAE, like last year, they implemented what it's called Tadbir Centers. So they want to slowly in, eliminate recruitment agencies and have these government-run Tadbir Centers that will be like kind of the central pathway as people enter the country. They go through these centers to get educated on their rights as domestic workers before they're deployed to all these households. Uh, so we don't know what the impact of the centralization that's occurring in the UAE right now. And then finally, labor standards are also promoted via employer interactions with domestic workers. And so, and this is sort of the core of my argument in this talk. And so domestic workers, to improve their labor conditions, engage in these everyday acts of what I call moral claims making. 
This refers to the process by which they utilize the standards created by moral entrepreneurs to negotiate directly for what they believe are quote unquote fair labor conditions. And embedded in this process is the mobilization of the morality of their employers. Um, so let me now address the effectiveness of using morals to elicit better working conditions for domestic workers. So as I noted, moral entrepreneurs construct these aspirational labor standards that are disseminated via media, legislation, or on the ground via domestic workers. So of moral entrepreneurs, Human Rights Watch is the one that has relied a lot on media to disseminate their aspirational labor standards. And so since 2001, um, this organization has regularly published and disseminated to the media country-based reports on the worst treatment of domestic workers, releasing a report, for example, on the UAE in 2014 and Oman in 2017. Um, suggesting its reach, employers we interviewed acknowledged hearing of this report in the media, um, but many of them dismissed the report as Orientalist. And it, the reports elicited a defensive response among Emiratis especially, um, saying that they, they're welcome to come to my house. I don't mistreat my domestic workers. That was like what many employers told us. Um, and a lot of the non-Emiratis said, well, this doesn't really concern us. They're only talking about Emiratis. Um, and, so, um, and so what's interesting, but what's so interesting though, the media, the media, the use of the media by Human Rights Watch, is, the impact of it is sort of countered by the fact that in the local context of the UAE, the majority of media reports on domestic workers are actually of those in which domestic workers are perpetrators of crime instead of victims of crime. And it's because the majority of media reports of domestic workers in the national newspapers are summaries of court dockets. And what that tells us is that employers are more often likely to report a crime committed by a domestic worker than a domestic worker is likely to report a crime committed by their employer. So it's sort of this an inequality in reporting of crime sort of that creates this narrative that domestic workers are the criminals versus the other way around. So the report of Human Rights Watch is sort of just like not as strong because of this counter narrative going on in the country that every day you're seeing reports of domestic workers abusing someone and most of the cases are of theft actually um, but now that right now there's a couple of cases of rapes committed by employ of domestic workers <clears throat> which i yeah was kind of like unbelievable and it's like of young children but then so yeah um so as i noted earlier the literature um has established that morals um potentially counter markets, either informally also by a collective protest or formally by a state intervention, but fail um, to fully apply to the, this doesn't really apply to the case of domestic workers in the UAE. And I wanna say um, this is the case even though all these countries with the exception of Bahrain has passed labor laws for migrant domestic workers. Um, but so anyway, there's, have you guys heard of Sondas al -Qatan? Okay, so she's, I wish I brought, a, video of her. So she's this social media influencer with 2.6 million Instagram followers. So when Kuwait and the Philippines in 2018 had a memorandum of understanding because the Philippines stopped the migration of domestic workers after uh, they found a frozen body of a domestic workers in the refrigerator. Um, so they had this memorandum of understanding. So she had like has uh, like, you know, goes off and she was like, oh my God, I'm never gonna hire a Filipino again because, oh my God, these Filipinos are like, gonna have a day off now, oh my God, you know, and they, you know, and they're gonna hold their passport. Can you believe it, they're gonna hold their passport. So, you know, so these laws do like have an influence also, I wanna acknowledge. Um, so, um, but then while that is the case, so she got a back, not really a backlash. The Filipinos got mad and sort of attacked her on social media, but then it's like back to business for her because it's sort of like what she believes is sort of the norm in the region. And so what's so interesting about her is that she followed it up with a statement in her Instagram page where she was like, everyone kind of knows no one follows the law. Like in the contract it says we're supposed to pay them X, but everyone knows we can pay them Y. And so then, you know, so she also says, yeah, these laws exist, but we're not gonna really follow them and then everyone still loves her. Um, and so the uh, dissemination of aspirational labor standards for domestic workers through the media and legislation um, 
I, I want to say, result in the promise of the standards increasing, and that it does create moral pressure for employers to improve the labor conditions of domestic workers. And what's important, too, is that the, it creates this public discourse around rights-based standards of employment. Additionally, they promise to function as moral toolkits that domestic workers can utilize um, to, as a to negotiate for better working conditions. So culturist and Swidler argued operates as a toolkit to be used and drawn upon and accordingly informs our behavior and decision making. So the aspirational labor standards that these moral entrepreneurs spread, we can imagine can operate as toolkits that um, domestic workers can draw upon to construct and negotiate for fair standards of employment. And so how does this happen? So let me, let me now explain how domestic workers draw from moral toolkits to mobilize morality. And so this is the gist of my argument for this talk. First, they have to learn of these aspirational labor standards. So interestingly, knowledge of these standards reaches them mainly through their mandatory participation in Philippine government out-migration programs. So scholars have generally been very critical of sending countries such as the Philippines for its facilitation of migration. For example, Robin Rodriguez accuses the Philippine uh, labor brokering state, and that's her phrase, of commodifying workers. But what Rodriguez fails to acknowledge is that sending states such as the Philippines and Indonesia do not just facilitate deployment, but they also advocate for the protection of their workers. So the Philippines actually has a robust protectionist program that they have implemented via bilateral agreements like the minimum wage, um, bans, so like they ban, like, you know, the ban on Kuwait, um, and the regulation of migration. So, for example, everyone has to be processed by a recruitment agency. And so giving legitimacy to the efforts of the Philippine government are the standards set forth by moral entrepreneurs such as the ILO. So second, domestic workers must define what are fair labor standards and be emboldened to negotiate for them. So a key goal of the Philippine protectionist program for domestic workers is to actually empower and educate them of their rights prior to migration. Specifically, those enumerated in the 1995 Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipino Act, as well as those established through bilateral agreements. And so this takes place in what's called a pre-departure orientation program. And so domestic workers, before they go abroad, must complete a very extensive program that requires, if you're going to the Middle East, at least three days. Um, and so in these seminars, domestic workers not only um, learn of their labor rights, but also of worst case scenarios that they will encounter abroad. So when asked about these seminars, interviewees describe them as quote unquote discouragement seminars. They're told of their rights like you're only supposed to work, um, like you're supposed to get eight hours of rest per day, uh, your employer should pay for your clothing and toiletries, and you should get a minimum wage of 400 US dollars per month. But then at the same time, they're also warned of their minimal rights, including the ability of their employer to ban the use of their cell phone. And also shared with them are the risks of their employment, rape. Every single seminar we went to, like the group would be told, you will probably get raped wherever you go. Um, and finally, they're given explicit instructions on what they should do and not do if they are abused. They're told, for example, that they must first and foremost talk to employers and inform them of their dissatisfactions. Like, oh, I'm being abused. Like, they're telling them, go to your employer, tell them you're being abused. And then if they find that they cannot resolve their employment by negotiating, um, then they should consider running away. Um, and then this advice, one repeatedly shared in the seminar, suggests that the Philippine government encourages domestic workers to mobilize the morality of their employers, right? So they're like saying, this is wrong, feed me, right? This is wrong, give me a day off, right? Um, so these seminars are actually significant as they instill standards of employment for these domestic workers and these standards, which are premised on notions of human and labor rights, then function as these moral toolkits that these domestic workers then take with them to their country of destination and then it's like in their imagination as they're doing their job, this is the sort of standards I'm supposed to have and when it doesn't match, then they're supposed to do something about it. So what's key here, right, is that you see the sort of liberal protectionist program in which sort of by telling these domestic workers you're going to be abused then if they do get abused the state can say I'm not really culpable for this abuse because I told you you were going to get abused right so you still went because even though we warned you and so that's also what's going on here um, so to illustrate the means by which domestic workers mobilize morality so let me return to the food the topic of food right so food like rape is prominent in these seminars so domestic workers in these seminars are told they're entitled to three meals a day. At the same time, they're told to not to expect to eat the same food as their employer. So for example, in the seminar I attended, the teacher asked this roomful, so there were 70 people in that room, I remember, 
And then the, the teacher asked them, who here eats chicken? Does everyone eat chicken in this room? And everyone's like, yes, we eat chicken. And then the guy says, the teacher, he's like, in Saudi Arabia, there are a lot of chickens, really big chickens, fat chickens. The chickens in Saudi Arabia are much bigger than the chickens in the Philippines. So who here likes to eat every part of the chicken? Raise your hand if you like to eat every part of the chicken. So it's wonderful that you like to eat every part of the chicken because in Saudi Arabia, you will get to eat the head the neck, the wings, and the butt of the chicken. Now repeat after me. What parts of the chicken will you eat? And then everyone says in unison, the head, the neck, the butt, and the wings. And so remember, then the teacher's like, remember, you will not eat the thighs and the breasts. Those are for your employers. So the example of food illustrates the instilling of moral standards among domestic workers. They learn that while they're not equals of their employers, they are still human and thereby deserve to eat three decent meals a day. So with this in mind, they will attempt to mobilize morality when denied this human right. So as an example, let me return to the dehumanized domestic worker I mentioned earlier, who, if you recall, asked her employer to feed her three times a day. We should recognize that her request to eat three times a day had been an act of moral claims making. Yet, as indicated by her experience, we know that employers do not always recognize their efforts. It is after failed attempts of moral claims making that domestic workers are likely to run away. And how many run away? 4% of domestic workers run away. Um, so, Indeed, after her employer told her that he would not care if she died from food deprivation, she opted to run away. She did so because it was then that it became apparent to her that her employer's morals were not one she could mobilize. Notably, it was not just her, but many interviewees who shared stories of how, of how each of they, in each of their own way, as well as in their own time, requested the implementation of particular work standards. Standards they learned from the pre-departure orientation seminar, whether it's a day off, a higher salary, more food, a lighter workload, and even access to a cellular phone. So this is not to say that all abused domestic workers engage in acts of moral claims making. Those likely to do so are first domestic workers with prior experience in other households. Second are those with access to other domestic workers who could confirm the validity of their claims. Um, indeed, in parks and food courts, we regularly heard domestic workers recite to one another plans they had to engage in morals, morals claims making with employers whether it's to have access to the internet or to secure a vacation to attend their child's graduation in the Philippines. Lastly, those with a bargaining chip, whether it's the emotional attachment of a ward or the request of the employer to renew their contract, are more likely to engage in acts of moral, morals claims making. So let me now conclude. So morals um, mediate the globe-bordered intimacy of unfree labor. So in the absence of protective legislation for domestic workers, and in the difficulty of its enforcement, moral entrepreneurs have set these aspirational labor standards, imposed the moral pressure for employers to somehow meet these standards, and embolden domestic workers to negotiate for better working conditions. So morals you know, potentially mitigate the abuse of domestic workers. Yet limiting efforts to mobilize moral morality is the arbitrary authority that employers do have over domestic workers. Employers without penalty or with minimal penalty can ignore the efforts of domestic workers to improve their labor conditions. Still, we cannot ignore the moral pressure that, they have, been, that, that have been created by moral entrepreneurs and hovers over employers. And so in this talk, uh, we learned that it's not necessarily through collective protest or th just through legislation that employers learn of these standards, but instead they also do, do so through the efforts of domestic workers to engage in acts of morals, claims making, and uh, mobilize their morality. So thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Extremely awesome. And um, I'm interested in this because Kenya is named yes. as one of yes. the sources of yes. domestic yeah. labor. I wonder if in your research 
you established deaths among the domestic workers, mysterious deaths, because yes. those are yeah. the, that is the feedback we get yes. back home. Yeah. In, in fact, we get most of them coming mm -hmm. home in coffins. Mm. And it is very, very regular. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happens to mm -hmm. them there. We, we don't know. And they just, they mm. are killed. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know yes. if you established that. Yes. And uh, I think we are unfortunate because it is a new industry in yes. Kenya. Yes, yes. So that um, um, they are no, yeah. we are not as advanced as the yeah. Philippines. Yeah. Where they go through this yeah. pre, yeah, uh, yeah. Pre, what did you call them? Yeah, pre departure, pre -departure yeah. Seminars. yeah, yeah. So they just go. There is no yeah. regulation. Nobody yeah. knows yeah. about it. And all I know is that there are so many deaths. None of them comes yes. from alive. Yeah. And the, the 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 level of torture. Yes. Even on uh, as exhibited by the dead bodies. Yes. Is, is, is uh, another question would be, apart from the, um, the gender aspect, the gendered aspect of domestic mm -hmm. did, did you establish the racial hierarchization of, of a gender? Because, yeah. Because uh, what yeah. I hear is, um, if, if an employer has two employees from different parts, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, chances are they treat them differently. Mm, yeah. So they are hierarchies. Yes. And what I hear from from Kenya is that uh, the Kenyan or the African yes. uh, it gets worse of all this. Okay. Did you yes. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. So okay. Um, so that's very interesting. So Kenya is actually the least written about of the domestic workers in the region. Kenya and Nepal. So we have some literature in Ethiopia. Bina Fernandez has written a lot on Ethiopians uh, going primarily to Lebanon, but we don't really have people writing on Kenya. We don't have people writing on Nepal right now. Um, but the other groups, there's like a, a more more uh, a greater number of literature on them. Um, interestingly, like you know, the literature is very like disparate in terms of its focus. Like the Indian, the literature on Indian domestic workers is like very positive. Like there's nothing about sort of these subjugations that we're hearing about um, that you had just mentioned, for example. Um, so let me sort of go backwards to the hierarchy. So what's very interesting from the perspective of um, Southeast Asians, the hierarchy of domestic work is that the Ethiopia, Ethiopians and Kenyans are favored by employers. And, um, and so, what's, so that's like a very interesting dynamic. Um, so that's their perspective. Um, I don't know if they're going with salary. Um, I, I don't know what the average salary of Ethiopians and Kenyans are. Um, but um, in, in sort of this, um, there's supposedly a closer alignment culturally with employers and um, African domestic workers than Southeast Asian domestic workers is what they say. What's very interesting is that there are African Emiratis. So there's a lot of like black Emiratis, and those people don't like realize that actually. And I actually, I mean, the way I found out was actually shocking too. When I went to Emirati households, like when I started getting invited to Emirati households, and I'd like walk in, it's like, oh my god, the wife is black. I mean, I was shocked, you know, because I didn't know that there were black Emiratis, and that's how I got uh, exposed to that. And so, according to the Filipino sort of this, the hierarchy is actually not what we would expect. That's the first thing. Um, in terms of gender hierarchy, um, there is sort of um, so the employer is always the woman, even though the sponsor is the man. Um, it's heavily advised for domestic workers not to even look at male employers in the eye, not to communicate with male employers, and to just sort of do everything through uh, female employers. Um, there is coverture, however, in the UAE. Uh, so I mean, it's so it's really. Um, so the woman of the household is very, very powerless. Um, and because of that, um, there's a lot of narratives of violence committed by women against women in, in that context. Um, in, in my cases, it's not, an, it not, there's no, it's not women are not abusing them more than the men, even though that's sort of the, the stereotypical narrative that we hear. Um, and then um, in terms of the deaths, right, um, I think what happens is um, you'll have like, you know, I, I, I don't know the exact numbers, like you say, you have 10 people go there, one dies. You hear about the one death, but you don't hear about the nine. 
and you don't hear about the experiences of the nine and that there's sort of this gradation of experiences with some very positive, some not so positive, right? Um, with a worst, obviously, case scenario being that you could um, end up dead um, and it could be that the state, like especially that goes on in Saudi Arabia a lot, where um, employers can um, claim a case against you and your sentencing will be like death by hanging, which is like a problem with Indonesians in Saudi Arabia. Um, but then there's also the death like committed by um, employers. And um, but, but so, I, so let me just sort of, I just know more about the Philippines. I know that cases of runaways in terms of the whole population, that's 4%. So 4% sort of get that worst, worst, worst experience. Um, so the 96% the will not get that worst experience that will compel them to run away is what's going on there, right? So the majority of them are not going to get killed. Um, is what uh, many of them have been there for um, two decades. Uh, many of them circulate across countries. They go Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, UAE, Jordan, and so they're very experienced um, domestic workers. Um, and um, so I think the, the narrative of abuse becomes sort of just the prominent one because it is so striking when it happens. And the fact of the matter, it can happen. Um, and so in, in my cases, what happens if you look, if you observe the intakes of the people who had the worst experiences? So, if I run away and I end up at my consulate or embassy, the first question of the uh, social worker to me will be, "What is the nationality of your employer?" And if your na the nationality of your employer is Emirati, uh, the first advice will be um, to not pursue a case and to just go home. Um, if it's like another employer, like Egyptian, Lebanese, it, it, they will pursue a case against them. Um, but the experience has been that there's sort of this legal absolution of uh, the crimes committed by uh, local employers. But during the time of my research, finally, one Emirati uh, was imprisoned for killing her domestic worker. And that was like a first. But then since so we were always trying to track down, will there be more Emiratis arrested for crimes they commit against domestic workers? We're not really seeing it. Right, we're already seeing it. Yeah. So I'm going to collect several. I have Adriana myself. So we're going to take them uh, in th threes. <laughs> so I'm going to start with Adriana. Thank you very much. And uh, you know, I thought that you wanted to do a claim, an argument about a variability at the beginning, and because you posed the question: Why, given that uh -huh. an equal relation and etc., yeah. the, the structural relations are the uh -huh. same, still we have differences. And then you presented different cultures. So, so when you talk about morality in the work site, morality also has a relation between employers and, uh, uh, and workers, domestic workers. I thought that you were going to the direction, more of a sociological direction, sociology of morality. I mean, who is who? So you are giving us some hints, even more than a hint, about the employers. Less so how the different cultures work, mm -hmm. and therefore different moralities mm -hmm. work with the sociology of the employers. And not just of the employers, but of the relations. For example, you know, pre-existing relations, historic relations, okay, post-colonial relations, mm -hmm. others, a cultural distance or proximity, mm -hmm stigma and so on and so forth because they all impinge upon what morality and moral relations are. Now, you went to a different direction and I want to go with you, follow you. You went to the direction of morality as moral play making and moral entrepreneurs. And here I have exactly the same question. What is the sociology of the moral play making? Who, who does more moral claim making than others, not because of the quantity, but the outreach of moral entrepreneurs. Is it the same? I can see how it works in the Philippines, but it works the same with other uh, constituencies in other places. Mm -hmm. Do all of them have exactly the same type of mm -hmm. uh, access mm -hmm. 
to this type of uh, mm -hmm. standards uh, or morality as uh, 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 standards. So not just in terms mm -hmm. of hierarchies, but also in terms mm -hmm. of relations. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I, I was wondering about your use of the term intimacies used quite often in the speech. I mean, of course, it's on the topic of the, the, the topic, conference. Yeah. But I was wondering whether this is a substitute, in your case, for domestic work, or whether one can think about intimacies in other employee-employee employee, employee relations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking, for instance, of agriculture workers in Israel, in the desert, you know, mm. living with families and so on. And so, so what's your use of intimacies here, and whether Morality and moral claims can be related to the nature of these mm -hmm. intimate relations. So you're mm -hmm. looking at them at the level of sort of a mm -hmm. institutional level, and I was wondering whether intimacies can be related in mm. this sort of context mm. to the type of relationship mm. that actually exists in domestic or other forms of mm. employment. Um, so I'll also ask and then we'll give you okay. a time to answer. Um, so my question is why morals are not rights, right? You keep talking about, uh, and being a lawyer, of course, I guess, but why <laughs> mobilizing morality and not mobilizing law? All the actors yeah. are trying to mobilize law. Yes. And then, the, and then the workers are informed about their rights. Now, yes. I understand that morality is part of it, yeah. but I'm wondering if they come, to, if they're, when they just, if they're in the negotiation with the employer, if they talk about, no, but this is my right for a day of work, yeah. or, whether, or whether you're being a nasty person, a mean <laughs> dehumanizing person, you don't yes. or maybe it's both, maybe yes. it's inseparable. So yes, that's yeah, my yes. Okay, well, okay, um, easiest one, um, intimacy. <laughs> so in my past work, I've tried to develop a concept called like intimate labor, in which I put, um, uh, for, uh, to rethink sex work and care work and domestic work as not so different from one another, but there's a particular qualities in that kind of occupation in which you um, have sort of um, approximate, not just like geographically, but, but there's like approximate dynamic to that relationship mm -hmm. in which um, there is like personal information that you like acquire with one another. And that is like central to defining that kind of uh, relationship. So I would not put agricultural work in that category, so it's just so. It, in, so in my work, I've just sort of broadly used intimate labor um, to capture a uh, to I think foreground a particular dynamic in uh, particular occupations, right? That really centrally defines them. To go to that actual question of in the type of relationship, what sort of claims or what the basis of claims might be? Yes. Yeah. Um, so what is um, the sociology of morals claims making um, is the question then. And so then as a sociologist, I'm always looking at not outcomes or not processed, you know, not processed persons, but I'm always like concerned about the processes that make persons, right? The process. So then as for me, the sociology of morals claims making is um, like really starting from an inductive analysis, right? Uh, like I'm very curious. It's like, why did this woman suddenly feel compelled to tell her employers that as a human being, she should be eating three meals a day, right? And so then I'm trying to explain the process by which she became that becoming of a person like that, right? And um, and as you as you noted, um, it's uh, you know is this a particular sort of uh, a cultural? Um, are there cultural factors that are playing this? Um, definitely, like um, and so I was like trying to sort of what are the structures that enable this to happen and what are the cultural factors that enable to ha this to happen, right? Yes, yeah, and so definitely institutional. Th that was key there with um, the the pre departure orientation seminars, right? And so then what's very interesting is that. Um, what I talk about, it's unlikely to happen with Indonesians, it's unlikely to happen with Kenyans, it's unlikely, and, and I'm very clear about that. That um, And so then it's funny because I do say, like, you know, we actually have to credit the Philippine government for having this institutional uh, mechanism of, like, even though they're passing blame and responsibility to the domestic workers, it is sort of empowering them to speak up, and a lot of domestic workers around them are jealous that they can speak up, right? They, that they know how to speak up. Um, and so then I, I'm sort of walking this line of being an apologist for the Philippine state for deploying their people to so many dangerous situations, right? But I think it's more complicated than just sort of dismissing them as um, commodifying them into these very dangerous <coughs> situations. So that's like, 
this tight rope that I'm walking. Um, and then why morals and not um, rights? And, and I think that I'm moving away from rights because um, I'm trying to foreground the informal um, context and dynamics of domestic work. Um, and so I think that's the movement from rights to morals, right? And so then, um, and so then I don't talk about this in this talk. Um, Helma knows about this because she heard me give a talk where I'm talking about freedom. So I really build a lot from this guy, uh, this, the guy this philosopher named Philip Pettit. And he's a Republican uh, theorist of freedom in which he looks at freedom as um, uh, being susceptible to abuse. So it's not like you can't quit your job. So like it's like these domestic workers are not unfree because they are in this bound relationship. It's because if they ask their employer, can I leave, and the employer could say no, is what makes them unfree, right? Because the employer could say yes, right? So then I think, building from his work, I'm trying to show uh, the informal mechanisms by which you can negotiate that relationship of unfreedom. Bargaining in the shadow of the law. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, uh, yeah. so we have Daphna, Naomi, Helma, and Thank you so much. I was wondering about the role of religion. Okay. I think you mentioned that they mm -hmm. come from the Muslim section mm -hmm. part of, of the Philippines. Yes. And, and religion is about morals. Uh -huh. Does it play any role in yes. these mm -hmm. negotiations? And okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks again for the fascinating talk and uh, also for doing the next part of um, well, thinking about this project. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the um, But I want um, to pick up Dila's question a bit. I mean, I, in a way, it made me sad what you, what you said. And um, I was. <coughs> Um, thinking about what why is this, and I get this feeling that um, after so many years of campaigning, the ILO campaign, uh -huh. the post, do we give up on the rights agenda? I mean that was somehow um, my my idea because um, and and I think it's it's fantastic how you show that there is space for agency. I mean somehow this is what. What they've told us, and, and I, I can see where this comes from, but at the same time, I'm just still speechless when I hear that there are employers who are, who are not um, um, imprisoned when mm -hmm. they tell their, <laughs> their domestic worker. And I mean, this is I, on the world scale. I mean, mm -hmm. so many countries, and I, I wonder, I haven't looked at the latest numbers of how many countries have. Um, um, ratified the ILO convention, but mm -hmm. it's still very few, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, I was thinking, I mean, do we, um, so what, what, what happens, you know, with this, with this political agenda and, and with the right to mm -hmm. And last but not least, Joan. Um, well, good, because it kind of plays off of that. My question was a little bit on the policy implications as well. Um, I think yeah. it's a little bit, you know, I think this is fascinating, but um, I guess I wanted to to ask you a little bit more about this, you know, the state pre-training, pre-migration mm -hmm. training, and, and what kind of role you see, you know, from your work, do you see that role? Is that something that other countries should be jumping in on, mm -hmm. or are there other, I mean, it seems mm -hmm. a little problematic, as you mentioned, are there other actors that might be able to be mobilized to help um, do this. I, it makes me think in the U.S. case of the Mexican consulates, for example, mm -hmm. that actually have taken kind of a big role mm -hmm. in immigrant rights yes. and kind of angled themselves yes. in that Ex way. Yes, it's the same thing, yeah. yeah. Anyway, 
Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, okay. So you point to sort of like one of the biggest like weaknesses of the the book, and it's like more religion is so key here, um, and you know I've read so like an, um, 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 Amrita Ahmad, she writes about like Indians and the converting to Islam. Um, there's also a couple of uh, Japanese sociologists writing on the religion of domestic workers in uh, the UAE. They're looking at Filipinos. And, um, but like my, none of my interviewees really talked about religion. And so um, that was kind of interesting. So I, can't, I couldn't really talk about religion because they didn't really talk about religion. Neither the employers nor the domestic workers really drew on religion when they talked about their relationship with one another. Is it coincidence that they come from the Muslim part of the Philippines? So in, so in, in my case, um, it's about like, 40, it's like 50-50, like 50% of my interviewees are from, uh, are Muslim and 50% are non-Muslim. Um, and, um, but there's a particular group from the Muslim autonomous region of Mindanao and they're probably the most oppressed of the groups that I, they were the ones most susceptible to illegal recruiting. So because of that, they were the ones mostly, probably likely who is gonna be assigned to an employer who is actually, um, disqualified by the state to employ a domestic worker because they have a past abuse case. So that's actually one way that they tried to stop them. But then you see like friends will then hire for friends. And so a lot of the people who get victimized are these people who are illegally recruited from the Muslim region is what happens. But religion otherwise didn't really play a big role. Um, so legal aid doesn't really exist there. Um, the, the most legal aid you will get is through your consulate or your embassy. And if your consulate or embassy are passive and not doing any advocacy work, there's not much that's gonna happen to you. And so the advocacy work done by Indonesia, for example, is basically they just decided to ban domestic workers from all 21 countries in the region. So there's like no more Indonesian domestic workers that are allowed to go to the UAE uh, as we speak. Um, the Philippines has also relied on bans if they sort of couldn't do more protection, but right now there's no ongoing bans for Filipinos in the Middle East. Um, and so, so then you, you, ask, you raised like a sensitive topic for me, this Human Rights Watch. It's like, what is, what is their methods? And so it's really interesting because then a lot of, you know, so there's like a lot of interest on quote unquote traffic people, but there's not much data on traffic people, right? And so then um, they say, oh, it's because it's so hard to reach, so we can't really know. And so we'll just do N equals one and make generalizations, right? Um, and so then ILO has actually like asked me to, help them, like, um, re, because they're trying to revisit the way they measure forced labor, and so they want to know more about my data to help them in that process. Um, I ha have not really um, assisted them because I've been doing other things. Um, Human Rights Watch also asked me for help, and it was like the biggest mistake of my life, and I'm not going to put this in writing, but I'll just say it in public. I say it in public. But they're like, they have this report, right, and I'm like so embarrassed that I was part of that report, and I'm so happy they didn't put my name in that horrible report that they put together in 2014. But they were like, we interviewed 79 or 99 domestic workers, and we're like, me and my collaborator were like, how the hell did they came up with 99? We were with them the whole time. And they were like, oh my God, we realized that they were like, go to like a table like this, hi, how are you, how are you? So it was like, they would talk to someone for one to two minutes and then they would count that as one of the 99. And so that like Human Rights Watch report from 2014 that is sort of circulating as fact was like probably the worst researched report ever. And after that I lost like all respect for Human Rights Watch. So I was complaining to Janie Chuang, so this woman who's worked with the Human Rights Watch, and she told me that it's actually by team. So like, you know, Human Rights Watch, you can't generalize because then the DC team, the Washington DC team was very ethical. Then this team is not ethical. Well, so the UAE team is not very ethical. So. So that, you know, so that was, so it's inconsistent, answer inconsistent, very inconsistent. But then I didn't see the positive ones, but our mutual friend said they, they're there. They, they're there. Um, so do we give up on rights? I don't mean to imply to give up on rights. <laughs> I think rights being there is why they can make claims. If the rights narrative wasn't there, they would have no basis to make any claim whatsoever. So I think the most I'm trying to do, so I apologize if this didn't come through, is how do rights that are up there come to life down here? And, and that's what I'm trying to illustrate. And I think that the ILO has been very effective in this region of the world 
with the exception of Bahrain, every single country since 2011 has passed a domestic worker law. Uh, and, you know, the question is, will employers follow the law? And this employer from Kuwait, Sondas al Qatan, the social influencer, told us no. in writing, no, right? And so then I think that's when the, you know, but then domestic workers are there to sort of make these claims that you can, um, yeah, that you should recognize these rights that the law says, right? Oh, and then I should add, then, so the UAE is trying to centralize the recruitment process. And so then everyone who goes to the UAE has to go through these tadbir centers. And supposedly the tadbir centers are educating them on their rights the same way the Philippines is educating them prior to migration. And so then the Philippines still doesn't trust the tadbir centers. And so they're worried that they're going to say something different from what they were told prior to migration. So the Philippines is going to do a repeat. So they had a pre-departure orientation seminar. Now they have a post-arrival orientation seminar just to remind them of the narrative they were given before they rode the plane to make sure it doesn't counter what the Tadbir Center says. So it's kind of like this war among the states is what you see on who is controlling um, the protection that, that's not really the protection of these workers, right? I think Thank, you. Up, so Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Rizal. I'll just say that we'll hear more about this throughout the two days. There's so much in your paper. I'm just thinking about Helen's paper tomorrow um, that's going to speak uh, to this in, in a very, in, from a different direction. So I really look forward to our ongoing conversation. There are, I know, more answers. I was looking more here. I didn't see if there were more hands here. So I apologize if I missed anybody, but we have time now uh, to attack Rizal outside <laughs> with questions. Yes. With friendly question. No. Um, and yeah. uh, we would uh, be very happy if you can stay with us for a meeting with Filipino activists um, that is going to begin at 8. Neely Gowin was sitting over. She just went out. She just went out probably to bring uh, the activists who are going to come. These are uh, Filipino families, I think mostly women, but activists who are uh, now fighting deportation, basically, of them and their families. So uh, um, it's going to be very interesting, and that's going to start here at 8. And we have some food outside. So uh, thank you for your patience and let's eat. Thank you very much. For thank you.